Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Aquarium Live. My name is Luke. I'm joining you here from the Aquarium of the Pacific, and we have got an amazing program lined up for you for the next half hour. We're going to be exploring all sorts of interesting things about how fish and other animals in the ocean sense their environment. Now, throughout this program, you can actually text questions for us to answer live on the show. The, pro the uh, text number is 562-286-1838. So if you've got a question about anything that we're talking about or you're curious about whatever, or even if you have a cool observation you want to share, go ahead and text us at 562-286-1838. And with your parents' permission, if you give us your first name, we'll even give you a shout-out on the air when we answer your question. And remember, of course, normal texting and data rates apply for all those you want who might be texting in. Um, if you are catching us after the show has already ended, if you're not watching this live, you can email us at live at lbaop.org. There it is there, live at, what am I doing here? Live at lbaop.org. And again, you can text us as well during the show, but if you're uh, asking a question afterwards, feel free to use that email, live at lbaop.org. And now let's begin our exploration of fish senses by looking at some fish and just seeing what they're doing. What are their behaviors? What are they up to? They've got a lot of interesting, uh, that's a lot of fish. That must be like thousands and thousands of fish. And see how they're all, and here's a smaller group, but they're doing something similar. They're all sort of moving together. They can sense what the other fish around them are doing. And look at this one. This one is really cool. It's almost like a cave made out of fish. The school of fish is so huge that there's these gaps and openings you can see. And look how these fish seem to know when the fish around them turn. They know, even though the fish are behind them, even though they're animals, they wouldn't be able to see right away. Now, the question is, how do they know when, how to do that? So we're going to be helped through our explorations today by Captain Joe, who's going to be asking and exploring a little bit of this same question for us. So let's go see if we can meet up with Captain Joe to get started on, this, on learning about fish senses. Hello boys and girls, Captain Joe of the Ocean Rangers. Now I'm here observing this huge group of fish behind me and if you just watching them, have you ever wondered on how they all move together and turn at the same exact time? I always thought this as well and I think this is a great place for us to start our exploration of senses today. Now, there are many reasons why a fish would be in a group or school. Well, not that kind of school. I'm talking about a group of fish. It's called a school. Now, so many different reasons why they would be in it. Maybe finding food, avoiding predators, even getting new boyfriends and girlfriends. But have you ever wondered why they can do this or how? That is a great question, Joe. I think we should start exploring that. Um, so how do they do it? Yeah, well, it just know? so happens that fish have the same senses as us, but they use them a little differently sometimes too. In addition to taste, smell, hearing, sight, and touch, they can also sense movement. And this is because of a special line of nerves down their side called a lateral line. That is a really, really good point. Let's explore that a little bit more. So maybe we can bring up uh, some fish to talk about as we explore this idea of a lateral line. So as Joe said, as Captain Joe was saying, we can sense a lot of things in our environment with the five senses that we and most animals have. Those, those senses that allow us to sense the world outside of us, right? The sense of touch, the sense of taste, the sense of hearing, smell. And which one did I leave out? Oh yeah, sight. But uh, if we look at fish, they're actually using an additional sense, one that we don't have, and that's the ability to sense movements in the, around them in the water. So if you watch this school of sardines in our Blue Cavern exhibit, which of course is leaving now. Oh, here comes another group of them coming around. This big school of sardines has a couple thousand fish in it, yet those fish are able to move and coordinate their movements together because every time another fish in the group makes a little move to the left or right or up or down, the fish around them can sense that change and they can all very quickly react to it thanks to the fact they have that lateral line. So yeah, they can't, a lot of them can see each other. That might help too, but the lateral line is what really allows them to coordinate those movements so well so they're able to school together without getting confused, without getting separated. Because that can be a very important thing for a fish. That, can, might, be the even, that might be the difference even between life and death for a fish. So if we watch these fish in front of us here, or behind me, you can see they're all, there's a whole bunch of fish that are schooling in the back. Again, those are sardines. 
And then you'll see in some of our other exhibits as we explore that there are plenty of other fish that school as well. And then, of course, that lateral line doesn't just help them to school. It also helps them to sense the movements of things that are maybe not in their school, so maybe predators that might be approaching and things like that. And predatory fish have got a lateral line too. So an animal like a shark, as it moves through the water, is able to sense the movements of animals around it, might be able to help find its prey that way. So it can be used for a lot of different things. Just like our senses might have a lot of different uses depending on the situation. The sh the, an, a fish, whether it's a bony fish like the sardines or a, or a shark or a ray, a cartilaginous fish, they use that lateral line to help tell them what's moving around them in the water. And here you can see our sharks here as they swim around. Their lateral line runs right along their back. You can't really see it. You'd have to look up real, real close, but they look like these tiny little dots. And that's how those sharks are able to sense movement around them. They can sense movement sometimes hundreds of feet away, depending on the kind of thing it is. So it's a pretty amazing sense. Now, Captain Joe was going to go uh, investigate the lateral line a little bit more. Let's see uh, what Captain Joe's learned. That is amazing. And not only that, but oh, studio, I, I think I just felt something swoosh against my arm here. I, something uh, swooshed against your arm, Captain Joe? Definitely felt something. Oh, really? Oh, what did you feel? There it was again. Boys and girls, what? I think there is Captain, something, there's something in here with me. Uh, wait, wait, no, no. wait, Captain! Um, I think Captain Joe might have just been eaten by an octopus. I don't know. Is that a thing that happens? No, that's not a thing that... That's, you don't think that... I think, you know, I think Captain Joe might be playing a game with us, to be totally honest. I don't think octopuses eat people at all. I don't think this is a thing that's ever happened at all, like, ever. I don't know. We'll have to find out if that octopus is, uh... Is it even a real octopus? I don't know. Well, whatever. We'll find out soon. I'm sure Captain Joe's going to be fine. But let's, in the meantime, look into something else for a while. Let's, uh, <laughs> while we're trying to see what happened to Captain Joe, let's answer some questions. So, let's see. Zoe was asking us a really interesting question. She said, do fish swim in mixed schools with different species of fish together? So that's a really good question. And the answer is... Most of the time, no. They generally swim with their own species, but you will see in certain situations schools forming that contain multiple fish, like let's, or fish from multiple different species. Like, that, like let's say that there's a group of predators that are chasing all the local fish around. You might see a few different species of fish kind of schooling together as part of a, as, as part of a tactic to try to avoid it. But oftentimes that's kind of temporary because those animals, one of the great things about schooling is, if you, is that a lot of the time the, the school look totally identical to each other. Like all the sardines, they look almost exactly the same. So it makes it really hard for a predator to choose one and to track it and to follow it and make sure that it, when it goes to bite, you know, that fish might move or it might miss, miss its aim because there's always different shifting fish around. But you will occasionally see situations where fish of different species will school together. Um, the barracuda in Blue, Cavern, in Blue Cavern, for example. But most of the time, the schools of fish tend to be one particular species. That's a really good question. And again, we can talk about it for quite a while because there are all sorts of different exceptions and situations where you might see. But the aquarium, all the schools that we generally see are, are all schooling together. Now, do we have any other questions while we're, uh, while we're uh, waiting for Captain Joe? All right, well, let's move on for the moment. Remember, if you want to ask us questions, you can easily text us at, what's the number again? 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. And now that we've uh, answered our first question of the day, let's take a moment and do a puzzle. Let's have a quick puzzle before we continue on. Now, if you've ever watched Aquarium Live before, you might know how puzzles work. We're going to bring up a picture behind me that we're going to gradually reveal parts of. And your job is simply to guess what animal you think is in the picture. Now, you'll have to look for different patterns and colors on the body of the animal. You'll have to look to see if there's any shapes you recognize. That might, that might remind you of a thing that you've seen before. Uh, so let's get started. I actually don't even know what this puzzle is going to be. So let's uh, find out what animal will be revealed. Let's start the puzzle. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. Oh, what sort of a creature is this? Let's see here. So don't worry about that other number, everybody. Just worry about the one that's, uh, that's, on, that's uh, on top here. we got an old graphic. Text your questions if you want to to 562-286-1838. 562 562-286-1838. And what is this thing? Well, it's not a fish, I, I don't think. You think it's a fish? I don't think it's a fish. Um, maybe, I mean, it could be a fish. I don't know. Is, any ideas? Well, this looks kind of, 
was very blurry over here. It's like it was moving real fast when the picture was taken. Huh. And over here we've got, those don't look like fish scales. Are those some sort of feathers? What are these things? I don't know. Let's reveal the rest of the picture. Let's see if we can find out what this is. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. This, what is this? What a weird bird. This bird is called a crested auklet. And this comes from the northern Pacific. So far, we've been looking at animals that are mostly in the war in warmer water. I guess those sardines are cold water, actually. So we have seen some colder water animals. But this animal comes from even farther up north than our local sardines. This is a crested auklet, which is a bird that hangs out in the really like the North Pacific and the really the northern parts of the world. They're, very, they're a coastal bird, like to hang out in cliffs and such. And you can see it's called the crested auklet because it's got that little crest. Now, we have been uh, waiting to hear back from Captain Joe uh, after his encounter with that, uh, what looked like some sort of giant octopus. I understand that uh, he has been tracked down. I believe he is still in the Northern Pacific Gallery. Let's see if we can get a camera on him again. Let's see if we can find Captain Joe once more. Let's see here. Is Captain Joe coming in? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Aha! My octopus and I could play baseball together. We'd be Captain. a whole team all by ourselves. Captain. Could you imagine that? <laughs> That'd be so crazy. Captain, you, you know you're on camera, uh, right? Uh, uh, Captain. Uh, wait, wait a second. Uh, this studio. Is, uh, very Come funny. Uh, I can't fight tentacles for much longer. Yeah, no I don't think, you're, uh, you're, so I don't think you're really fighting an octopus, Captain Joe. Uh, I'm pretty, I, I don't. It's a purple one. The kind that eats ocean rangers. There's no kind of octopus that eats ocean rangers. That is, and furthermore, I mean, there are purple what? octopuses, but I think you're okay. Oh. Well, that's good news. Yeah, I think so, right? So, Captain Joe, we were wondering... Yeah, if we could... you're probably right. Yeah, but I, I wonder know, where right. I could learn more information about octopuses. You can. Octopuses have amazing senses, too. Actually, huh? we have an expert on octopuses. Oh, so I am. I bet you we can find an expert really close that can teach us all about these awesome animals. I think that's a great idea. We'll get back to you, Captain Joe, when you find an expert. All right, so Captain Joe is going to go look for an octopus expert for us. While he's doing that, I want to take us on a little visit to the aquarium's animal care center. Now, the animals here at the aquarium, they need to be cared for all the time, whether the aquarium is open or closed. And just like they need their daily care, you know, things like a nice safe place to live, the exhibit they live in, like they need food and all that, they also, of course, need, need veterinary care. The same kind of care we might get when we go to the doctor or go to the hospital or anything like that. If we get injured, if we get, if we get sick, we would, need, we would need medical care, right? Well, for an animal, you would call that veterinary care, which is the same thing. So let's go visit the Molina Animal Care Center, which is the, basically the veterinary hospital here on site at the aquarium and learn from one of our vet techs, whose name is Shara Seals. She's going to be telling us about some of the work that's going on in there today. Let's go check out uh, what Shara's up to. Hi, boys and girls and ocean rangers. My name is Shara Seals, and I'm a veterinary technician here at the Molina Animal Care Center. This is our veterinary hospital for all of our animals here at the aquarium. We do take care of a lot of different types of animals here, from the smallest of fish to the biggest of sea lions, and then birds and reptiles too. Today I'm gonna to tell you a little story about one of our reptiles, Lloyd. He's a chuckwalla. His keepers noticed him acting a little differently, and so they brought him to the hospital so that we could check him out. Dr. Adams examined him, and I took x-rays of him, and this is what we found. Reptiles don't drink a lot of water, so waste doesn't pass through them like it should. Over time, inside Lloyd's bladder, this grew. It got too big, so we had to take him to surgery to remove it. Let me show you our operating room. This is where we performed Lloyd's surgery. All right, this is our operating table. For Lloyd's surgery, we put him under anesthesia with this machine right here, which means he went to sleep for a little while. And while he was sleeping, we listened to his heart and his lungs 
and we even monitored his temperature with this mat that's kept him warm during surgery. During Lloyd's surgery, we were able to remove this. And afterwards, we gave him stitches so that he could heal. After a couple of weeks, the keepers brought Lloyd back to the vet hospital to remove his stitches. Lloyd was an excellent patient, and now he feels much better. Thanks for joining me. Turn my mic off there for a second. So, sorry, I turned my mic off for a second. I think I'm back now. Uh, we have more questions. While we were listening to Shara talk about veterinary care for a while, we I got a whole bunch more questions, and I'm going to see if I can answer some of these. First of all, we got a bunch of questions about octopuses, and it looks like these are about a lot of their senses, too. So, first off, Olivia asked, can octopuses see? Yes, they can. Octopuses actually have pretty good eyesight, just like the other members of their family of animals. Squid, octopus, and cuttlefish can all see pretty well. And what's really interesting is that they see they see it in a kind of a different way than we do. If you look at an octopus's eye, it looks really weird. You know how we have like a round, that round black spot in the middle of our eye, it's called the pupil. That's where the light goes into your eye for you to see. An octopus, sometimes it'll be a U or a W shape and really weird things like that. And that's because octopuses see colors in a different way than we do. But they can still see colors. They just have a really odd way of doing it. And that allows them actually, because they can see the color of their environment around them to actually camouflage themselves and blend in with their surrounding environment. So they have to be able to see to be able to do that. And it was a mystery for a long time how exactly that worked. Now, Landon had another really good question. Do all sea creatures have a lateral line or fish only? That is an excellent question. So not all sea creatures have a lateral line. A fish do, fish, every fish I've ever heard of does. But there are other ways that animals in the ocean can sense movements around them. They might not necessarily do it with a lateral line, but they might have antenna or special kinds of bristles, kind of similar adaptations that those other animals have developed. So it's a question of really, that's really specific to each individual animal. Some animals can't sense movements around themselves at all. Other animals can maybe do it a little bit. Other animals can do it really, really well, depending on the kind of sense adaptation they have. And it might vary also depending on the size of the lateral line, the type of fish, because you know some fish may have maybe able to sense movements a certain distance away. Other fish might be able to sense them farther away because maybe they have a bigger lateral line or they have more nerves on their lateral line. And this is one again one of those questions that that uh, is really big question because there's so many animals in the ocean. Now I got a couple of other good questions. In fact, I think a few of them are kind of related to each other. So let me see if I can summarize these. First off, Benicio asked, "Do octopuses or why do octopuses squirt ink? They generally squirt ink in order to." confuse and get away from predators. If, if, if something is trying to attack an octopus, it squirts out a big cloud of ink and then jets it away. That's a pretty effective way of avoiding a predator because the ink's not fun at all to swim around and animals don't like it. It kind of stings and things like that. So octopuses don't use their ink except for really except for anything except self-defense. Now I got a question. How much do they squirt? How much ink do they squirt? That is a, <laughs> you know, I don't actually know the measurement. That's a really good question. It's not as much as you'd think, I'll tell you that. It's very potent, it spreads out. If you've ever watched one of our squid dissection classes, you can see what it looks like when we open up the ink sac of a squid. And the ink sac's really tiny in the squid we use, but we can get enough ink out of that to cover basically an entire plate, like it had just been drawn on with a marker or something. So it's a lot of, uh, the ink is really, really concentrated, and when it gets out of the water, it really covers a lot of territory. But even so, it's not like, you know, it would turn the whole you know, like a whole area around the octopus dark. Usually it's just kind of a, a cloud that kind of isn't right in the way in front of the octopus. The, in the images I've seen, the cloud of ink might be a few feet across at the most. Now I got a few other questions and a couple of these are related. One, one person asked if fish blink. And there's a related question about this, do fish sleep? Audrey asked that one. And she asked also, do they close their eyes when they do this? When fish, so fish are very different from us, right? They're so different that sometimes you asking if they sleep might be a little hard to answer because the thing is that sleep for us is probably very different than the kinds of things that other animals experience. When we go to sleep, we have dreams and all these different things and our body does certain kinds of stuff 
to help kind of repair itself from the day and heal itself when we sleep. This is why if you don't get enough sleep, you'll get like, you can get like an upset stomach and you don't feel so good because your body needs sleep to fix itself up. Now, fish do rest. And sometimes they go into, a, they go into like a real sort of deep rest that, and where they'll sort of kind of seem like they're asleep, like they hardly even respond to the world around them. But when they do this, we don't, know, we don't really know enough to be able to say whether we should call it sleep or maybe call it something else. Sometimes scientists call it torpor, which is kind of a weird word. That's T-O-R-P-O-R, which is just basically like a low activity sort of, uh, sort of mood a fish gets in when it's really at rest. But you will f see fish resting for sure. But generally, fish do not close their eyes when they do that because most fish don't have, any, don't have the same kind of eyelid that we, you, know, you would expect where you can cover your eye completely. A lot of fish have different membranes and things they can cover their eyes in, but there's no real like eyelid that they can close. Man, there are so many questions coming in. Let's see, what happens if a fish gets lost? This is another one from Audrey. <laughs> that's a good question. Well, that's what one of the things they have their senses for, right? So it depends. So different fish will want to be in different places. Some fish might be lost if they get away from their school. Another fish might get a, might get lost from its nest, and other fish maybe just don't get lost because they like to wander around. They're always moving. So it depends on the fish. But if a fish does lose its way, they have senses that allow them to, that might, will usually allow them to find their way back. Uh, they can use their sense of smell in addition to their sense of sight. They can use their sense of hearing. And they can sense and see and smell and hear things, of course, that would be pretty hard for us to notice because they've, they've, you know, they've always lived in that environment, right? So their senses are tuned in to the kinds of things that happen under the water. So it's kind of amazing to me, actually, not just with fish, but with so many animals, how good they are at finding their way and uh, that they oftentimes can find their way across, you know, many fish migrate hundreds of miles over the course of a year and so on and can find their way back to the same places again and again. It's really pretty amazing. Now, we have a couple, of, well, so many questions. Let's see, how about we go back to Captain Joe for just a moment here while I look at some of these questions and we'll come back and answer them. I think, actually, were we going back to Captain Joe? Oh, yeah. So Captain Joe was going to go find us an octopus expert, right? Maybe if he's found that expert, maybe uh, she can tell us some of, the, uh, some of the things that we've been wondering about. Let's see if Captain Joe found that expert. Hello, boys and girls. Guess what? I found an expert that works here at the aquarium. This is Angelina. I'm an aquarist here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. I take care of some of our fish and invertebrates that live in our cold water exhibits in our Northern Pacific Gallery. My favorite animal to take care of here at the aquarium is our giant Pacific octopus. Now, we're here talking about senses today, Angelina. Could you tell us about some of the senses that an octopus has? Octopuses are pretty amazing, Captain Joe. As you can see, she can change her color and her texture to camouflage herself while living in her exhibit. Now, not only can she do that, but she has hundreds of suction cups down her arm that she uses to grasp things like her food, as well as explore her exhibit. And she's really, really strong. Now, not only is she really, really strong, but with those suction cups, she can even taste. Now, taste, we talked about this beforehand. Do giant Pacific octopuses eat ocean rangers? Oh no, they don't eat ocean rangers. Uh, our octopus here at the aquarium likes to eat fish, shrimp, squid, clam, mussels, and especially crab. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Angelina, on teaching us about our giant Pacific octopus. She's very, very cool. We're going to go ahead and head right back to you guys at the studio. Thanks, Captain Joe. That was really interesting. So we learned more about the octopus, and we got to see it in action. That was a very busy giant Pacific octopus. So we've learned a lot about senses so far today, about how the different kinds of senses that animals in the ocean have, and they're really a lot of ones that are very similar to the ones we have. They're just adapted to a different kind of environment. We've also learned that animals in the ocean have additional senses sometimes that we don't have, like, for example, the ability to sense movement around them with that lateral line. Now, we have some more questions, and this is another good one that a lot of these still do have to do with fish, with, uh, fish senses. Addie asked a great question, how do fish float? That is an excellent question. Now, fish, you'll actually, for one thing, Addie, most fish float, but some fish do not float. There are fish that actually sink when they stop swimming. The best example of this are things like stingrays and sharks. Stingrays and sharks are fish. They're just a special group of fish called cartilaginous fish. They actually don't float. When they stop singing, swimming, they sink. But most fish, the bony fish, like our Queensland grouper here or all these other fish that you see in the exhibit, 
these fish do float. Even when they don't move their fins, they'll stay, in the, they'll stay floating in the water like a balloon would float in the air. And they do that because they sort of have a little balloon, actually. Inside their body, almost all bony fish have this little organ that is, that is, is we, call it an, we call it an air bladder or a swim bladder. And that swim bladder allows them to maintain what's what we call buoyancy, get, make them control their, their, where they are in the water and how much they float, how much they sink, and so on. Basically, it's just it's a little air sac. So that swim bladder is how fish float. But again, not all fish are able to float. Now, we have a few more questions. I'm going to step out so I can look at these real quick. What, let's see, oh yeah, Hannah asked another good one. <laughs> this one is, uh, is not so much about fish tanks, but another, a cool question anyway. How do hermit crabs walk? You know, I think, I don't know if we have a video of a hermit crab, but I think we have a video of some crab, don't we? We don't have a video of a crab? Oh, well. Well, you can find crabs pretty easy online if you need to find any crab videos. But when you watch, walk crab, watch crabs walk, you know, they tend to walk in a lot of weird ways. Hermit crabs have an especially hard time because they're carrying around this big shell on their back. So oftentimes it'll look like I'm kind of dragging it along. But that's because that is only really when they're kind of scared and don't want to come all the way out of their shell. Most hermit crabs, when you leave them, if they're left alone, they'll actually kind of stand all the way up and kind of lift the shell all the way up onto their back and then walk just like any other crab would. But yeah, they do have to carry that big shell around with them all the time. But it's a little less heavy than it would because they are under the water. So that, that, that kind of helps. Now, anything else? Oh, we have so many questions here. We have questions about what do clownfish eat? Um, Max and Abigail asked that one. We talked about clownfish in the last class. And I don't think we talked about what they eat. Clownfish eat, well, one, for one thing, when you looked at the clownfish, you saw they have a real small mouth, right? So clownfish are going to be opportunistic foragers. They're going to be picking up sometimes stuff that they find lying around in bits and pieces on the reef and in the sand around them. They might also grab plankton a lot. Because one of the great things about living in an anemone is you have a safe place to just sit there and wait for things to come to you. And oftentimes, the anemone itself catches things. So clownfish can sit there in their anemone and just wait for things to float by, which they can grab, basically plankton. And sometimes they uh, might be catching food that the anemone would want to eat. Other times, the anemone might catch food they want to eat. But it's a relationship that works, works out pretty well for both of them. Now, a few more questions. We had some questions about sharks. Tegan asked, where do sharks mostly live? Aside from saying in the water, I, there's not really more of an answer to that. Sharks live in pretty much every part of the ocean. There's sharks in the deepest, coldest parts of the ocean, sharks in the warmest parts, the, the shallow parts, all these. Oh, we got a fish pooping behind me. That's what a, what a spectacle. So looks like I think that was our Queensland grouper there. See this cloud here. You guys got, wow, that was really fun. So <laughs> this is why we have filtration systems here at the aquarium. Um, now, always, always full of wonderful activities going on here at Aquarium Live. So, um, where do you, so sharks pretty much live everywhere in the ocean, and there's even sharks that can live at least part of the time in freshwater environments, like the bull shark, for example. So sharks live pretty much everywhere, Tegan. Excellent question. Now, let's see. We have a few other questions. We had another question about how much do sharks eat. Sharks actually don't eat that much. That's a, that's a common thing. People think that sharks are always just wolfing down big piles of food. Actually, sharks have pretty slow digestive systems, so they only eat about one or two pounds of food per day. Now, it might be that a shark maybe goes a few days without eating and then eats a big meal, but if you spread it out, if you, kind of, what, do, what, if you do what's called an average, you can, your average shark only eats about one or two pounds of food per day. If it's a really big shark, it might be a bit more, but lots, most sharks don't really eat that much. And let's see, we have so many other questions. We'll do, a, we're going to just take a few more of these questions. We have a couple minutes left. Let's see, Abigail asked, do starfish have suction cups like octopuses? This is another kind of sense-related question, by the way, because you saw that octopus had suction cups it uses to inspect its environment. Starfish have something that's kind of similar, but instead of having suction cups, they more have suction straws, I guess you could say. If you look at the bottom of a sea star, as we like to call them here at the aquarium, or a starfish, you'll see all these little, little tubes sticking out. Those are called tube feet. And they do work by sucking onto things. That's how a sea star is able to grab onto a rock and how it's able to pull itself along and climb on stuff. But they, instead of, having, instead of just being a cup, they're actually a tube that goes all the way deep into the, into the sea star's body. And that's not just how they, suck, how they suck things in, but it's also part of the way that they move water around inside their body to move nutrients. Really good question. 
Uh, let's see, we have a few other questions here. Lauren asks, do lots of fish go to the animal care center? Luckily, on any given day, not many fish go to the animal care center. In fact, there's some days where there's hardly any animals in there. Because the, the animal care center only generally, you know, brings animals in when they need to be brought in for a surgery or a, to get a medicine or to get some kind of checkup. On any given day, usually there's animals that come in, sometimes more, sometimes less. But we don't have to have, but a lot of our animals would never in their whole lives go to the animal care center because they never have a health problem that requires them to. So that's a really good question, though. There are also some animals that if they do have a health issue, maybe it's better for us to come to them. So our vet doesn't bring every animal to the animal care center. Sometimes if an animal like a sea lion needed a checkup or something, the vet would probably go to them to do that instead of bringing them to the animal care center just because it's easier and less stressful for them. We have a couple more questions. Are there stingrays that don't sting? It depends on how much, how far you want to go and call them a stingray, but long story short, yes, there are stingrays that don't sting. And there are, in fact, quite a few rays that don't sting. And we can look at a, one stingray here. If you check out Shark Lagoon for just a moment, you'll see we've got a reticulated whiptail ray there in the back. On rays that sting, what you want to look for is on the top of their tail. You, you won't be too far away for us to be able to really check on the reticulated ray. But I don't know. We have a closer look at any of our stingrays? Or maybe a stingray picture just in general? So, and there's our, our mangrove ray swimming around in the back there. So, uh, but you can almost kind of see it. Stingray stingers are located not at the end of their tail like a lot of people expect. They're actually located on top of their tail about usually about somewhere between the base and about halfway down depending on the kind of stingray it is and you can actually see it it looks kind of like a sharp popsicle stick sometimes you can see little like teeth on the sides and those stingers are not are found on lots of rays but not on all of them there are plenty of rays that don't sting um now let's see here any other questions i think that's all the questions i see here but we got some really really good ones Oh, now one more question. What is a stingray's favorite food? Dane asked this one. This will be our last question. Dane, good question. Stingrays, for the most part, are actually kind of bottom feeders. They spend a lot of their time, and their bodies are kind of shaped in such a way that makes them ideally able to move along the ocean bottom and pick up things like clams and shrimp and crabs and stuff. And they have flat teeth. Most stingrays have flattish, flat or rounded teeth that allow them to roll and crunch up hard shells. And that's the kind of stuff they like. So mostly they like to eat hard-shelled or soft-shelled invertebrates, though they will sometimes eat other stuff. There's also a few stingrays that eat plankton, like the most, like the, and this isn't a stingray, but the manta ray, the largest of the rays, is uh, famous for that. And they eat in a totally different way. But the stingrays we have at the aquarium are all, all interested in feeding mostly off the bottom. Though one really weird thing, here at the aquarium, a lot of our stingrays actually like to eat lettuce. They, they've developed a taste for it over the years. And it's kind of a fun, fun food to give them that doesn't have a lot of calories, so they can get it kind of as, as a fun treat. It helps to make, make them have a kind of a more fun thing to do during some of our feedings if they're not, if they're uh, in addition to the regular food they get. Now let's, we're just, looks like we're well over time here, guys. So we're going to wrap up here. But before we do, let's find Captain Joe and say goodbye to him. And then we'll uh, see anyone who wants to join us again in about a half an hour at 11 o'clock. Captain Joe. Thank you, boys and girls. It was my pleasure taking you through the aquarium today and teaching you more about animal senses. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to get back to some research that I started earlier today. Captain Joe, signing out. Thank you, Captain Joe. It's such a good book, isn't it? <laughs> and the Ocean Ranger salute everybody. Just like that. And oh, he's hanging out with his octopus friend again. Well, that's great, Captain Joe. Everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at Aquarium Live. If you're interested in continuing to learn with us today, we have got more programs scheduled. You can read them about them, about them on our website. If I remember correctly, the next one at 11 o'clock should be Marine Mammals and Conservation. Then I think at 1, we are doing a program on, let's see if I remember, oh, a macro dissection. I'm not sure which one of us is going to be teaching that, but it should be very interesting. And then after that, we're doing another exploration program as well. So if you uh, want to join us for any of those, Come on back, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you here at the Aquarium's Online Academy. Bye, everybody.